Um, I need to tell you that I feel so honored and humbled to be here this morning. You women need to know that I don't think there are any other pastor's wives on earth who get to have this kind of experience that you are having here. This is rare. This is extraordinary. And I know part of the reason, a large part of the reason that this is so extraordinary is because of a woman named Lois Evans. And I know you know that. Um, and uh, Lois is smart and compassionate and beautiful in every way and very gracious. And actually, Lois and I just met last night for the first time. So um, that was a great pleasure for me, Lois. And um, you have already enriched my life. And I will leave here uh, taking you with me as a great source of inspiration and, and challenge and hope. And uh, I thank you for that. It's true, yeah, yeah. I also know that, that part of what an extraordinary leader like Lois does is she surrounds herself with extraordinary women, and that, is, that has happened here. And just last night and this morning, I just got to kind of sit uh, as an observer and watch this, this entourage of women working together and creating something beautiful, and, and I'm glad to be a part of it. Um, the only problem I have with Lois is that she has nine grandchildren. And I only have one, and I do not think that's fair. But um, my little Henry, uh, actually, he's two and a half, he's pretty big, he's kind of a bruiser. He is uh, the new love of my life. He is my new obsession, and uh, Bill and I are having a great time being grandparents. Last night, my daughter sent me a, a photo on my iPhone, and uh, yesterday at preschool, Henry was riding on a little car, and he fell over, and now he has this huge red and purple and black and yellow bruise on his whole chin. Wouldn't be such a problem, but he's supposed to have his, his formal portrait done on Monday, so that may have to be canceled. But the thing that scared me is that in this photo, he had his little chin sticking out, and he was so proud of it. <laughs> I thought, you know, we are in trouble with this kid. <laughs> But, but he is, is a great joy in our life, and we've had a lot of fun with that. Um, as, as Priscilla said earlier, um, we, Bill and I have been in ministry for a long time. We just celebrated our 35th wedding anniversary. And yes, thank you. And this fall, we'll celebrate 30, the 34th anniversary of our church. And we have a 32-year-old um, daughter and son-in-law, and then little Henry, and a 29-year-old son. So we've been at this a long time. Um, and really, I would think that I would be a little bit further along in this process than I am. Uh, you will learn this morning that I have been a really slow learner. And uh, last night, Lois said something about how God can take our mess and turn it into our message. Well, this is what you're going to learn this morning about me. <laughs> um, I, I want to begin to saying that standing up on a stage and talking to women is not at all my favorite thing to do. Um, I would much rather be sitting down one-on-one uh, -on -one with you and just hearing your story. In fact, last night a young woman came up to me afterwards and, and wanted to get together and, and talk, and I had to, I couldn't, I had to go on to another meeting, and I can't see you, but you know where you are. That made me really sad last night that we couldn't sit down because I really wanted to hear your story, and I, and I hope that we can today. But I think there is tremendous power in women's stories. And I have never met a woman who does not have an extraordinary story. And when I get to know her and hear her story, inevitably, I like her. And I'm, I'm drawn to her. And I find out that we have much in common. And so I, I believe very much in the power of stories. Also, I need to tell you, I am not a Bible teacher. I am not an expository teacher. I'm not an inspirational speaker. I am a storyteller. And really, the only stories I know are pretty much mine. So um, <laughs> that's, that's what I do. But I want you to know that, that I tell my story in the hopes that it will help you to um, uncover and, and see more clearly and honor your own story. And so I hope that this morning can be a time that together, even though I'm the one doing the, the talking, but that together we can have sort of a soul connection and honor each of our lives and the way God is working in us 
um, the way he worked in the past, the way he's working on us now, and the way he wants to work in us in the future. So that's, uh, I just want you to know uh, where I'm coming from when I stand up here in front of you. Now, I want to begin my actual talk here by telling you about someone who I used to know very well. She was a nice girl. Obedient, polite, socially acceptable, pleasing, a really nice girl. Oh yes, her gaze seemed a bit empty at times, and I sometimes had the feeling she was just going through the motions of life, but they were such nice motions. I mean, everyone liked her. She had an uncanny ability to keep almost everybody happy, almost all the time. The only one who seemed to be not really happy was her. But I could be wrong. I mean, she was always smiling. True, I rarely heard her laugh, and you'd never accuse her of being wildly in love with life. But she had such a nice smile. And she was a very caring person. Well, in a passive sort of way. I mean, she was never going to turn the world upside down. But she was a very nice girl. Well, what I mean to say, as you might have guessed, is that I was a very nice girl. A nice girl. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a nice girl, especially when you consider the alternatives. A naughty girl, a mean girl, a bad girl. Well, I didn't want to be like that. And I mean, I really didn't. What I wanted was to be a godly girl. And I took that very seriously. Now, it may help you understand why I took it so seriously if you'll journey back in time with me for a few minutes. I grew up in the 1950s and 60s in a very small Michigan town where I attended a church that was a fine church in many ways. But the preaching that I heard as a child was pretty much hellfire and brim brimstone. I heard a lot about sin and punishment and guilt and shame. Well, by nature, I was a very sensitive little girl, and I concluded that if I wanted to earn the favor of this hard-hearted, demanding deity, then I would have to work very hard. I would have to be very good, and I would have to walk a very straight and narrow path. And so I did. At age 10, I traded my ballet slippers for a flute, convinced that dancing was a sin, whereas music could be an acceptable form of worship. And from then on, I did my best to make what I thought were God-honoring decisions. If there were rules to follow, I was going to be following them. If there were things to give up, I gave them up. If there was work to do, I did it. I was determined to earn God's love. I was also convinced that part of earning God's love was to earn everybody else's love, too. To please everybody. To keep everybody happy to be very nice. Every day I got out of bed and I prayed, Dear God, what do you want me to do today? Anything, just tell me and I'll do it. Now, unfortunately, I seldom got a clear answer, which was very frustrating because I knew how important it was to get everything right. How could I keep myself under the umbrella of God's favor if I didn't get everything right? So I kept trying. For years I kept trying praying and reading my Bible and working harder and harder, hoping that one day I would experience what this whole Christian thing is supposed to be about, hoping that one day I would feel God's love and know it deep inside and be able to rest in it. But I learned that you can only work hard and seek love for so long, and eventually you just run out of energy, and that's exactly what happened to me. At that point, I had been a pastor's wife for about 17 years, at age 22, I was delighted to marry a man who felt called to the ministry, because I definitely felt called, too. I never viewed starting a church as something I was obligated to do because of who I was married to. I wanted to do it. But after 17 years, I was so exhausted, I literally did not want to get out, out, out of bed in the morning. In fact, to state it plainly, I did not want to go on living. Later, I came to understand that I was not just tired. I was very seriously depressed. Now, most people didn't know that. I was still pretty good at going through all of the nice girl motions, but things were definitely not nice on the inside. So fighting the all-too-common myth that only certifiably crazy people seek professional help, 
uh, I went to see a Christian counselor. That counselor helped me to understand that there is an alternative to being a nice girl. And it has nothing to do with being naughty or mean or bad. I learned that the opposite of a nice girl is a good woman. <laughs> being a good woman means trading the safe, passive, people-pleasing behavior of niceness for the dynamic power of true goodness. Whereas a nice girl of any age lives out the script she learned as a child, a script that is grounded in powerlessness, a woman acknowledges and accepts her power to change and to grow and to become a force for good in the world. Whereas a nice girl lives according to the will of others, a good woman has only one goal, to discern and to live out the will of God. A good woman knows that her ultimate calling is to be part of God's plan for redeeming all things in this broken world. A good woman knows that she cannot be to all things to all people and that in fact she may displease those who think she should just be nice. She is not strident or petty or demanding, but she does live according to conviction. She knows that the Jesus she follows was a revolutionary who did not keep everybody happy. That picture of a good woman made me want to be one. I was 39 years old when I walked into a counselor's office and said, I have been working so hard to keep everybody else happy, but I am so miserable that I want to die. I spent the decade of my 40s uh, working very hard and digging out of that hole. Now, um, along with Lois, I'm quickly marching towards 60. And I've discovered that growing up is definitely an ongoing process. I have not yet arrived, and I never will. However, I have learned a few things along the journey toward good womanhood, and I want to talk about those things this morning. First, I learned that a good woman's life is grounded in the love of God. It's grounded in the love of God. Now, in my 30s, I would have told you that my life was grounded in that because the theology I claimed as an adult assured me that God did, in fact, love me. But in reality, I was still living according to the demands of my childhood guide. My faith was grounded not in God's love, but in my own desperate striving to find that love. And after nearly 35 years of that kind of striving, I was exhausted physically, emotionally, and spiritually. In fact, the first thing my counselor told me was that I needed to get off the treadmill and rest. I needed to rest. And the problem for me was that my God would not let me rest. My God demanded action, service, work, and striving. Rest was absolutely out of the question. And yet, in my heart, I knew that what this counselor was saying was true. I knew that I needed to rest, and I needed to radically change my life. I knew that I could not face the future if it was just going to be a repeat of the past. But it seemed clear to me that I could only rest if I could get rid of that childhood God. So on a hot summer day in 1991, I stretched out on my back on the deck of a little sailboat. I looked up into the clouds, and I addressed the God of my childhood. I can't do it anymore, I said. I can't keep striving for your love. Maybe there's a God somewhere who doesn't drain the life out of his followers, but I don't know where that God is. You're the only God I know, and I cannot carry the burden of you anymore. Now, I had never called God a burden before. I mean, I knew the right words to say about God. God is my strength, my refuge, my helper in time of need. God is my gracious father, my tender mother the lover of my soul. But despite those words that I knew so well, what God felt like in my life was a horrible weight dragging me down, and I could just no longer carry it. So I turned my back on the God of my childhood. I was not trying to be rebellious. If there was anything I had never wanted to be, it was rebellious. But I could no longer carry the burden of a harsh and demanding deity. Now, as the ultimate nice girl, it was no small thing to turn my back on God, and I didn't broadcast that decision. I was still a pastor's wife, and I did not want to lead anyone else astray. 
But the truth inside of me what it, was that I was done with a God who daily sucked the life out of me, and I was too tired at that point to try a search for replacement. Now that undoubtedly sounds a little extreme when you hear that. Um, and it definitely seemed that way to me too at the time, but in retrospect, I see it more like this, that the true God in grace set me free. Mm -hmm. Even in my desperation, I don't believe I would have had the courage to walk away from my childhood God unless the spirit of a different God had whispered in my ear, just do it. It's okay. The true God knows your soul needs to be purged and the wound of the false God needs to be healed. So do it. Turn your back. Walk away. It's okay. So I dropped the burden of God and I rested. Of course, there were still tasks and duties I simply had to attend to. I had a husband and I had children and I had responsibilities. But whenever possible, I did the only thing that I really had energy for at that time. I sat in an easy chair and I looked out the window. Now at first I felt horribly guilty about those quiet, unproductive moments, so I would try to fight the exhaustion. I'd say, okay, today I'll get busy again, I'll prove my worth again, I'll chase God's love again. But then I couldn't do it. I just didn't have the energy and so once again, in the free moments of my days, I would take up my post by the window. And because nature has always nourished me, I sat there and I watched the summer leaves take on the colors of autumn and the fall rain turn to snow. I still felt guilty and utterly useless, but I couldn't deny that something deep was beginning to stir in me as I yielded to the beauties of nature. As fall turned to winter, I built fires in the fireplace and listened to music and, and flipped through the pages of art books. In my bedroom alone with the drapes drawn, sometimes I even danced. I felt like a little girl again, not a nice girl seeking to please, but a playful child free to enjoy the simple pleasures of life. Now, I'm sure that some of you cannot relate at all to gazing out the window or paging through art books, but given my personality, that's what seemed so most restful to me, and so that's what I did. And as I did that, an amazing thing began to happen. My body was recuperating, but even more, my soul was coming to life. And as it did, I began to long for a God again. Not the God of my childhood, certainly, but some God. Alone at night in bed when Bill was out of town and my kids were asleep, I sometimes had the sense there that there was a presence there, that somehow I was not alone in the universe, that there was something, someone to whom my soul was drawn. And so I decided to open my heart just a little crack to that mysterious presence. Into the void, into the stillness, I whispered two simple words. It's me. It's me here. And what I sensed in response was a whisper as gentle and as soft as my own words. I love you, the whisperer said, right here and right now. I love you so much that I want you to rest. I want you to sit and receive the refreshment of my creation. I want you to listen to music. I want you to dance in the quietness of your bedroom. I want you to be like a child, secure and free in the presence of an adoring parent. And I want you to know that all those years when you were working so hard to try to please me, I was trying to tell you to slow down. I saw you killing yourself from the inside out and I was trying to stop you. But the many false voices in your head drowned out the single true voice in your heart. I wasn't the one cracking the whip, the one telling you to work harder, the one who made you feel guilty when you relaxed. I was the one trying to fluff up the pillow and tuck the blanket around your shoulders and tell you it was time to rest. I was the one trying to love you. I have described that brief encounter with that loving presence many times, and yet every time I type it into another talk, I weep again. I think that when I'm on my deathbed, I will recall that moment as the pivotal point in my entire life, because to be truly embraced by the love of God changes everything. 
It's not a matter of knowing about God's love or saying the right words. It's something that happens on a level deeper than words and ideas and knowledge and thoughts. It's something get, that gets inside of you, and no matter what happens, it never leaves. Now, I don't know why I was allowed that extraordinary experience. Perhaps it's because the absolute failure of my own answers and wisdom and energy had left an internal emptiness into which the true God could enter and speak. And if that's true, then I consider my depression, my exhaustion, and my complete inability to get on with life as the best thing that could have happened to me. In the past, my search for God's love had been focused, as I said, on work and effort and striving. But now I can honestly say that the center from which my whole spiritual life flows is the time I set aside daily to be silent in the presence of God and simply inviting God to fill the empty space of my heart. And every time I do that, I feel as if I fall into that well of love again. And that love centers me and it calms me and I believe it heals me on a level deeper than my conscious mind can even understand. Out of that quiet resting comes a call to compassionate action in the world, but it is a very gentle thing. In it is little of the trauma and the anxiety that I experienced in the past, and that is a radically different way to do life. It's life and it's ministry that flow from the fullness of joy and gratitude that God puts in our hearts. Yes. It's what Frederick Buechner describes as that point where our deep gladness meets the world's great need. And that is the kind of life that I believe God calls all of us to, but it has to be grounded in that true daily experience of God's love. Now, I'm sure that many of you know and experience that, but I suspect that some of you sitting right here desperately need to rest in God's love right now. Maybe like me, you've been clinging to a toxic notion of God left over from your childhood. Or maybe you just have been so caught up in the busyness of life that you haven't taken the time to let God love you. As I have been praying about this, this morning, I have, I have prayed that this, this time together would be a time for some of you to just breathe deeply, let your shoulders drop, and, and just relax in that love of God. And so I think right before we go on, I just want to stop and just have you close your eyes for a minute and just, just in this quiet night, let God love you. Oh God, we thank you for loving us. Uh, the saddest, the most tragic thing is life in, in life is when we forget that. Oh God, help us to, to feel it in a way right now um, on such a deep level that we will never forget it. That every day we can go back to that and just rest in the unfathomable, total, complete, enveloping love that you have for us. Thank you. Well, the second thing that I learned as a good woman is that she understands that she is not just loved in some generic way, as an anonymous human being, but she is loved as an individual, as a very unique creation. Her personality, her gifts, her passion, and her dreams, those all matter to God. Now again, if you had asked me in my 20s and 30s if that was true, I would have said, well, of course that's true. But I didn't really live like it was true. Actually, I lived as if everybody else's unique life mattered, but mine didn't. Now, many women p tend to pay more attention to other people's lives than they do their own, but I have to tell you that nice girls elevate that skill to an art form. And many of us, as pastor's wife, just perfected over the years. But shortly after I started counselor, my counseling, my counselor asked me why I looked at the world through Bill's eyes. And I said, I don't. And then I spent the whole next year proving that I did. For months, I could not answer the counselor's questions without voicing Bill's perceptions, Bill's values, Bill's insights, and Bill's opinions. 
It would have been comic if it were not so sad. I knew far more about Bill than I knew about myself. I knew his gifts and temperament. I knew his strengths and weaknesses. I knew his needs and desires, his passion and calling. I knew his dreams. I knew his recreational interests. I knew his long-range goals. I knew his preferred spiritual disciplines. And yet, I knew none of that about myself. Not a bit of it. Now, there were many reasons why that was true, but certainly one of the main ones was that Bill's ministry was so demanding and yet so fruitful that I gradually slid into believing that my life could just not possibly be as important as his. What was important was to keep Bill going and to make his life manageable and to facilitate his ministry. Now, Bill didn't consciously ask for that, but it's what I perceived as right. I grew up in a time and a place where the underlying attitude was that a woman's highest calling in life was to lift up her husband. And if she didn't have a husband, well, there was probably some other man somewhere who needed a woman to, you know, <laughs> lift him up and serve him. Um, we all understand that, don't we? Now, again, I would never have said that my life didn't matter, and Bill certainly would not have said that, but I definitely end up living as if it didn't matter. Now, when Bill and I started Willow, I was very young, and I didn't know what I was good at. I didn't know what my spiritual gifts were. I just knew that I wanted to serve God and, uh, and other people in any way that I could. And so when we first started uh, the church, I played uh, in the flute in our, in our church band, and I loved that. Uh, that was a, a, uh, I just loved playing the flute. I, I started when I was 10 years old, and I still get it out um, not publicly anymore, but just for fun sometimes, and that was a, I, I love doing that at church. I also wrote articles in church publications, and I was a young mom at the time, so I started a ministry for young moms. But as the church grew and Bill got busier and busier, I had to pick up virtually all of the time-consuming practicalities of keeping the home and family going, and it just left little time for anything else, and so I gradually ended up pulling back from all those involvements that I had. Also, as the church grew, there were more, uh, many more miscellaneous demands coming my way. People to see and calls to make and meetings to schedule and parties to plan and all those things that you will all understand so well. Um, eventually, my life became focused almost entirely on household chores, secretarial tasks, administrative details, and entertaining. Now, for some women, and I know this is true, that would have sounded like a dream life. And I know some women looked at me and thought, wow, you have it made. But increasingly, I found myself hating my life. And I really did not know why. And so I concluded that I was just a selfish, demanding person who was not willing to do what God had asked me to do. And so I tried to change my attitude, but I just kept getting more and more miserable. And the more miserable I became, the more guilty I felt. And so the more I confessed my sin, and for years, I was totally convinced that I was just a really, really bad Christian. But then my counselor helped me look more honestly at my natural abilities and my spiritual gifts, and it became quite clear what was wrong. By nature, I am not a task-oriented person. I am not good at handling details or complexity. I do not have one shred of the gifts of administration, helps, or hospitality. <laughs> yes. So for years, I had shaped a life around gifts that I did not have, and I was completely neglecting the gifts that I did have. Uh, my true gifts are more in the areas of encouragement and mercy and discernment, so I would much rather deal with people than with tasks. I also love dealing with words and ideas, and I feel called to write but writing requires time and solitude, and, and I had neither of those. Now, obviously, at that point, when I realized what was wrong, I should have and could have made some changes in my life. But the fact is, I didn't. Uh, occasionally, I made half-hearted stabs at it. I talked to Bill and, and our kids about our need to handle responsibilities more equitably at home so that I could have a, a little more time to do other things, as other mem members of my family did. I repeatedly considered getting ad administrative help to, you know, help handle some of the responsibilities that were coming my way from church, and I know there were people um, as volunteers who would have been willing to do that, or, you know, eventually we would have had money to hire someone to do that, but I never did that. Now, I want to clar clarify something here before I go on. I go on. I, it wasn't that I wanted a full-time career or ministry outside the home. 
I celebrate, I truly celebrate women who are able to do that. And I cheer them on, but uh, given Bill's rea uh, the w reality of his work schedule and the ages of our children, I knew that even in a best case scenario, that would not have been an option for me, and that was fine. I, I didn't aspire to that. It was really okay. However, I just could not shake that longing to use my true gifts consistently in some way. And yet I just couldn't bring myself to make the choices necessary to do that. You see, nice girls just don't ask for help. They'd rather do anything than inconvenience other people. So they don't honor their own needs, their own desires, and their own dreams. Underneath, they really don't think it would be okay to do that. Now and then over the years, I would get involved in some kind of ministry that I really loved. Uh, from the time I was a little girl, my passion was to respond to the needs of people who were living in poverty, and I eventually went to college to become a social worker. And so when we started Willow, my dream was for our church to become a community of people radically committed to compassion and justice. I served in some of our first ministry partnerships that we had in the inner city of Chicago. I went on some of our first serving trips to Latin America. And, you know, I lived in this affluent suburb of Chicago, and yet sitting in a squalid little shanty town in Mexico, passing out canned peaches to little barefoot kids was where I really felt most at home and where I felt most alive. But whenever my involvement in any kind of ministry like that inconvenienced Bill or the kids or in any way kept me from living up to other people's expectations, which, of course, it always did, then I would withdraw. I would back out. I would quit. And when I felt frustrated or angry about having to do that, again, I would confess my sin and my demanding spirit and say, okay, God, I'm sorry, you know, I'll try to have a better attitude. And I really thought that was the right thing to do. I thought that den denying my gifts and passions was part of what it meant to die to self. I didn't realize that there's a difference between dying to self-will and dying to sin and dying to anything that is keeping me from following Jesus. There's a difference between that and dying to the self that God created me to be. God does not call us to die to the self that he created us to be. Yes, it is very true that we must live according to the ebb and flow of seasons and that our, our movement um, from ministry or life inside the home and outside the home, that must change during those um, the ebb and, uh, ebb and flow, flow of the seasons. And I think that's true for both men and women, both fathers and mothers. And yes, there is a necessary sacrifice. There's suffering even that is part of the life of every follower of Jesus. And we need to ask for grace and strength to endure those times. But if year after year our lives are consumed with what we, we've not been gifted or in passion or called to do, and we never have a chance to slide into the sweet spot of giving out of our true self, we will probably pay a higher price in ministry and in life than God is asking us to pay. And the saddest thing is that when we do that, nobody wins. I thought I was sacrificing parts of myself for the, for the sake of others, but here's the truth. Bill didn't win. Bill married me in part because he saw in me a level of confidence and competence and energy for life and ministry that he resonated with and that he fell in love with. But decades of denying my true gifts and passions had drained me of the very vitality he had been drawn to and left me feeling incompetent and insecure, not at all the person that he had hoped to share his life with. So he did not win. And I have to say that our kids did not win. They got a devoted, conscientious mother who picked up after them and made sure they got their homework done. They got a mother who adored them and prayed for them and always wanted the best for them. But they did not get a happy mother. They did not get a fun mother. And they did not to get to see up close and personal a woman really, really alive in God. Now, my son needed to see that. But even more, my daughter needed to see that. She needed to see me operating out of strength and passion, and I could not give her that. Fortunately, there were other women in her life who modeled that for her, and I'm grateful that as I have chosen to lean into my own true life, I am now able to give her something that I could not give her before. But if I had it to do over, I would not have waited so long. 
I would not have robbed her of the model of a woman authentically engaged in the life that God had called me to. I also had to say that my church did not win. Yes, my church needed and still needs Bill and his gifts and his passion. He is an extraordinary pastor, and I never wanted to hinder what he could offer to our church. But our church needed me too. Not because I'm anything special, but just because that's where God put me. And he put me there for a reason. There was a perspective and a dream. There were words and influence that I believe God wanted me to offer to my church. But I did not show up. I did not value what I had to offer enough to actually offer it. And to all of you who are here this morning, I want to say as forcefully as I can that your family, your friends, your church, your community, and the world need you. Don't let who you truly are get lost or buried or devalued. What is in you matters, and what is most truly you matters. You have learned lessons and experienced pain and known joys and gained a perspective that nobody else has. You have an answer to the world's problems that is yours alone. Now, I don't know where God has put you or where he will put you, but he's put you there for a reason. For your sake and for and everyone else's, you need to show up with what is truly in you. Whether he's called you to set up shop in a big corner office somewhere or at your kitchen table. Whether he's called you to minister to large groups of people or to one person at a time. To give 40 hours a week or simple moments here and there. What you have to offer matters. I know what it's like to wear a life that is not my own. But I'm learning what it's like to, to shed that restrictive robe and just put on me. That's where my strength and my power are, and I believe that's true for you too. Don't let that be taken away from you. Agreed? Okay, yay. Now, the third thing that I learned is that good women sing their song even if they're terrified. Whatever they're called to do, they do it. They don't let fear stop them. Now, some years ago, I went away alone for a few days to do one simple thing, to pray for guidance. I said to God, I don't know the next step you have in life for me, so I'm going to pray for your guidance, then I'm going to listen to your voice, and then I'm going to do whatever you call me to do. And this is what I sense God saying to me during that private retreat. Okay, I will guide you. I will lead you into the future. But if you really want my guidance, you better get ready for an adventure. You better prepare yourself for new challenges and unexpected opportunities. You better get ready to learn and stretch and grow. Well, that is not exactly what I had hoped to hear. I, I wasn't really looking for an adventure. I just wanted kind of a nice, uh, meaningful life. But I had told God that I would do whatever he said, and so I decided to accept the adventure, whatever it was. So shortly after that, I received a telephone call, and it was from a, a pastor at a church in Northern Ireland. And he was inviting me to come and, and speak at his church four times. Now, immediately, I listened to that invitation, and I said, no, absolutely not. Surely that cannot be the adventure that God has in mind for me. <laughs> now, for some of you, might, that might sound like a wonderful uh, option, a great adventure, but at that point, I had done enough public speaking to know that it was definitely not my favorite thing to do, uh, especially if I had to, you know, cross a culture and, and all of that. Uh, and I was definitely not a fan of international travel. I can't sleep on planes or in hotel rooms. Um, I was really bad then. I'm still pretty bad now. But I don't really like constant change. I don't like the unknown. I don't like to have to stretch that way. So a good traveler, I was not. And so I said, no, uh, of course, I am not going to do that. And then I sensed God say, yes, you are. <laughs> and I said, no, but I'm too afraid. And then I sensed God saying this, if you weren't afraid, would you want to do this? And I thought about the women at that church in Belfast. I thought about the trouble and the pain in their lives. I thought about the privilege of standing before them as a fellow struggler and reminding them that God loves them and that he wants to walk through life with them. And I thought, yes, if I weren't so afraid, I would want to do that. 
And so I sense God say, well then go. Don't let fear stop you. And at that point, I realized that I had let fear stop me so many times in my life. It was almost like I had two selves, a true self and then a fearful self. My true self wanted to say yes to the challenges of life. My true self wanted to give and serve and make a difference. But my fearful self constantly said, no, you can't do that. You might fail. You might embarrass yourself. You might disappoint people. And I realized at that point that disappointing people is the greatest fear of the nice girl. It truly was my greatest fear. And it was bad enough when I was growing up, growing up anonymously in, in Kalamazoo, Michigan. But when I became Lynn Hybels at Willow Creek, it just got worse. The voices in my head were ruthless. Oh, you're Bill Hybels' wife? You're it? We thought you'd be younger, older, taller, shorter, dutcher, prettier, blonde. We thought you'd be a great Bible teacher or a powerful leader. We thought you'd be more dynamic, more subdued, more outgoing, more demure, deeper, shallower, more fun, more profound. In general, we just thought you'd be more impressive. We thought you'd be one of the big girls and you're just this ordinary person. I mean, I had it all worked out in my mind, the many ways that I could disappoint people, and I couldn't face that. I couldn't open myself up to that potential for disappointing, so I hid out. I didn't show up. I stayed in the background where it was safe, and I missed out on potential pain. Yes, I certainly did miss out on some of that, but also on the potential of being used by God. For years, my true self that wanted to say yes to God had been silenced by my fearful self, and I knew it was time to end that pattern. I didn't want fear to be holding me back anymore. So I said yes to the Northern Ireland trip. Now, I wish I could tell you that my fearful self just rolled over and died the minute I said yes, to, um, but the truth is it didn't. Um, on the contrary, it screamed more loudly than ever. You made a terrible mistake. You will fail. You should cancel the trip right now. And honestly, I wanted to cancel the trip. But God said, ignore the fear. Trust me, do what I've called you to do. So I wrote the trips and I went to Northern Ireland. Of course, fear went too and told me that every talk I had written was terrible. And every afternoon before I spoke, I had to say to fear, just be quiet. God has called me to do this and I'm going to trust him. And every night I was in awe that God could use someone so weak and fearful as me. And I returned home with a wonderful memory of a truly great adventure. And I learned an important lesson. I learned that I didn't really know myself very well. I thought I did, but fear always hides the truth from us. Fear magnifies our weaknesses and it hides our potential. Only God really knows us and the path that we need to be on. Only he can lead us into the future. I also learned that my first response to just about everything is fear. If I listened to the voice of fear, I would basically do nothing. But part of what it means to move from being a girl to being a woman is that I choose to talk down fear. I choose to talk down fear. When fear says, what have you gotten yourself into now? I say, I think I've gotten myself into the will of God and I'm not going to back down. And when fear, <laughs> when fear says you are not smart enough, experienced enough, or strong enough to do what you're trying to do, I say, well, I serve a God who specializes in using people <laughs> as flawed as me, and I will not give up. When fear says, you are going to disappoint people so badly, I say, well, maybe so. But I'd rather disappoint, risk disappointing people by not being good enough than risk disappointing God by not being brave enough. <laughs> And when fear pulls out the stops, I borrow God's words to Timothy. Lynn, I have not given you this spirit of fear. I have given you a spirit of love and of power and of a sound mind. And I claim the words of God to Joshua. Lynn, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged, for I am the Lord your God, and I will be with you wherever you go. Now, I suspect 
from some of your responses that maybe some of you have a fearful self that holds you back and convinces you that you could never be a world changer. Well, I just want to welcome you into the crowd. <laughs> yes. I have a feeling that you are sitting in a row filled with women who know fear. In fact, I think that maybe fear is the biggest hurdle that most of us have to face. Maybe it's the fear of saying honestly to God, I can't keep striving for your love. I'm tired and I need to rest. I know how frightening that, frightening that is when your whole relationship with God has been based on you striving and working for him. It's frightening to pull back and rest. Or maybe it's the fear of saying to the people close to you, hey, I'm sorry, but I've got to live my life. I can't just keep picking up the pieces of yours. Again, I know how scary that is. I felt that. I mean, will they love you if you start honoring your own life? Will you have any value to them? I know how that feels. That's very scary. Or maybe it's the fear of failing if you do try to live your own life. Now, here is a confession. As unhappy as I was with the task-oriented, detail-intensive, administrative nightmare of my life, as long as I stayed buried in that, I never had to face the fear of throwing myself into something that I really wanted to do. I mean, really putting myself out there and then failing. As long as the life that I really wanted was just theoretical, I could tell myself that you know, if I had the freedom I deserve, then I could really do this great thing for God. But if I actually made the choices necessary to do it, I might discover that I couldn't. I might fail. So I kept finding reasons not to try. And I'm sad to say that it took me nearly, thir it took me almost 30 years in ministry to be willing to fail, and I am not proud of that. And the truth is that what finally pushed me over the ledge was turning 50, and realize that life is short. And if I didn't start living it, <laughs> I might never have the chance. Yes. A few years ago, my friend Holly ran the Chicago Marathon. While I stood on the sidelines watching for her, another woman ran by wearing a t-shirt. And on the front, the shirt said, done watching. <laughs> yeah. Mm. On the back, it just said, doing. And I burst into tears. I saw that t-shirt and I burst into tears for two reasons. One, because I don't want to just run the race of life. I, I don't want to just watch the race of life anymore. I want to get in there and I want to run it. Done watching. Doing. The second reason I cried was because that woman and my friend Holly were running in a pack of women. And they were cheering one another on. Some of them were running strong. Some of them were bent over double with pain. Some of them literally had to be carried across the finish line, but they were doing it together. You know what some of us fear more than anything else? We fear each other. I feared other women's success because I thought it made me look bad. I feared other women's choices because I thought that invalidated my choices. I feared getting close to other women because I was miserable, and I didn't want them to know that. So for years, I lived in isolation. I lived without a tribe, and I suffered for that. I needed friends to hear my pain and to share my tears, and then I needed friends to tell me it was time to dry my tears and get off my chair and do something. I needed friends to grab my hands and say, okay, let's pray about this. And then I needed friends to tell me to rent a silly movie that would make me laugh hysterically. I needed friends to say, you have gifts and passions and dreams, and we are not going to let you withdraw from life. You need to show up. And then I needed friends to say, you need to lighten up. You need to go shopping. You need to add a little color to your black wardrobe. <laughs> purple, purple counts. <laughs> Said, you need to celebrate. I needed friends to say, who you are is okay, and we love you. The best thing that I ever did was tiptoe out of isolation and join a tribe of women. We need to choose to believe that we are all in this together. And we need to accept and honor our own lives so that we can accept and honor each other's lives. And if we do, 
if we help one another, if we cheer one another on, if we call one another to our highest and truest and best selves, then we can become a powerful force for good and for God in this world. And if ever, if ever the world needs an army of good women who dare to make a difference in the world, it is now. Yes. Many years ago, Margaret Mead, a very brilliant woman, said this. She said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. My version of that quote is this. Never doubt that a community or a church house or a ballroom full of thoughtful, committed women filled with the power and love of God, using gifts they have identified and developed, and pursuing a passion planted in them by God. Never doubt that these women can change the world. Now, at the beginning of this talk, I said that the opposite of a nice girl is a good woman. But what I really wanted to say, and what I'm going to say now, that the opposite of a nice girl is not just a good woman, but a downright dangerous woman. <laughs> a woman who shows up, a woman who shows up with everything she is and joins the battle against anything, against anything that opposes the redeeming work of God in our lives and in the world. And that's what I want to be. And that's what I hope you want to be. That's what we need to be for ourselves, for our families, for our church, for our community, for the world, and for God. And I believe that he's calling each of us to be righteously and radically dangerous. I firmly believe that women are the greatest untapped resource in the world. We have gifts talents, skills, education, resources that women did not even dream of having in the past. And beyond this, we have the tremendous power of compassion. When women are freed up and when they know who they are, they have this incredible compassion that this world so desperately needs right now. One of my goals as I move into the next era of my life is to mobilize women on behalf of other women. That can mean responding to the loneliness or the grief to the woman who sits at the desk next, of you, next to you, or maybe responding to the woman who lives next door to you who just lost her job or lost her husband. Or it may mean offering our prayers and our money and our time to women halfway around the world whose kids are dying of hunger or to women who have been trapped in a life of prostitution, not because they want to, but in their little village, there is no other job. And that's the only way that they can feed their children. We all know that all of the great global tragedies disproportionately impact women. That's true. Women's are the greatest, women are the greatest victims. Worldwide, 60% of the people suffering from HIV AIDS are women. Did you know that? Most of us don't know that. That 70% of the desperately poor people in the world are women and their children. That 80% of the people right now living in refugee camps are women and their children. And again, that millions and millions of women and little girls are sold in the sex trade every year. And you could all go on and on and tell me stories from your own community of the way that women are oppressed and victimized. And these are our sisters. All over the world, these are our sisters. And we need to join together on their behalf. You know, you can go to the poorest village in Africa. And I've spent a lot of time in Africa in the last six or seven years. You can go to the poorest village where, where people are suffering and dying of HIV AIDS, when there are so many widows and orphans and uh, children not getting an education, not getting enough food to eat. And if you empower the women, if you pray for them and walk beside them, if you educate them, if you help them start a business, they will change that village. That's, that's the truth. I've seen that. And I, I just came back from the Middle East. I've been spending quite a bit of time there in the last year. And just about a month ago, I met with uh, a group uh, of Christian, Muslim, and Jewish women in a community where there is constant war and violence. But these women came together and they said, 
bombs and violence and armies. This is not the way. We need to come together around our common humanity and around our respect for one another and around our love for our children and bring peace to this world. I mean, women are amazing. Women are the greatest untapped resource in the world. I have a quote that is on my desk. It's, it's taped up to a little lamp on my desk so that I can see it every day. It says this, I am only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. And I will not let what I cannot do interfere with what I can do. You see, if I do what I can do, and if you do what you can do, and if we encourage the women in our churches, in our sphere of influence, to do what they can do, together, we can change this world. We can, we can prepare a path for the kingdom of God to come and spread with power and peace throughout this world. God is calling us to that, and he's given us the privilege of doing that. I'd like to end, um, if, if I might, by just having you all stand up here. Um, I, I think there is a symbolism to us um, deciding to, to stand together you know, with one presence. And I'd just like you to close your eyes, and I'm going to close in a prayer that I'm going to say on behalf of all of us. And um, it's a prayer that I believe God has given me for women uh, in the 21st century. I, I think it's a rallying call for us, and it's a way for us to um, acknowledge our submission to the purposes of God in this world. <laughs>